This episode is sponsored by Fantasy Flight Games. Episode 25 of the Board Game Geek Podcast, where we geek out about board games, the mechanisms behind them, and the people who create them. I'm your host, Candace Harris, and I'm really, really super excited to be here today with my good friend Ryan from Man vs. Meeple. How's it going, Ryan? Hey, everybody. So happy to be here and to finally be invited on, Candace. I'd love to take some time out of my day to talk to you. Oh, thank you so much. It's always such a pleasure like when I get to bump into you at conventions and that like that very first BGG con where we met oh, yeah. and got to like hang mm-hmm. out play games eat barbecue together oh yeah don't remind me I want that back so bad <laughs> are you going to BGG con this year you know that's actually still up for debates uh because I am going to PAX I recently started a new job in the industry so oh, cool. uh yeah so for those who don't know I work for Japan and make games now doing marketing and communications and so that kind of does affect my convention schedule I might need to be at specific shows so I think I'm going to be at PAX Unplugged oh cool and unf- it's it's so sad that those cons are so close together yeah it makes it so hard to do both but I would really like to do both Okay. So we'll see. We'll see. Actually. Gotcha. Gotcha. <laughs> wow. Congrats on the uh, your new role with Japanime Games. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much. That is awesome. And like, have, what else is new with you since Gen Con? Well, uh, post Gen Con, uh, we at Man vs. Meeple have been kind of diving deep in all of our Gen Con releases, trying to get as much content made on as many games as possible. We've done a lot of live plays focusing on Gen Con content. We've been doing a series. Uh, that we really like called Just Played, where we just really just play a game one time and then kind of talk about our very first impressions. And that's, that's cool. that format has been a lot of fun and people seem to really like it. And so we're trying to knock out as many Gen Con releases as possible. Cool. I'll be on the lookout for those because I know your your video for Age of Innovation before Gen Con got me like super awesome. duper hype for Age of Innovation. Like I was already excited about that game because I just I, I've always loved Terra Mystica so I was like yeah I'm gonna buy that you know but I watched right. I watched that video like the week before Gen Con and I'm like oh, now I'm like yeah, really really excited to play this. you know and and those aren't those videos are not sponsored at all um so it's not like we're you know out there just trying to push a particular game but we get a game like that and we like I'm a big Terra Mystica fan too so I was already very excited to play that and I, I think you can tell when we're doing those kind of videos uh, it's just infectious when we when we really like a game. Um, it's very difficult to hide how much you really love a particular game, and so I think it really came out when we were talking about that. Totally, totally. So <laughs> every time for for listeners out there, every time I reach out to a potential guest co host about coming on, I usually I would say like ninety percent of the time will send them like a handful of different topic ideas just to see if it like something resonates with them or if maybe it spins off into a like a different idea of something we can talk about on the episode and for almost you know this podcast has been on for almost a year now I congrats by the way (laughs) oh thank you thank you In, in most cases uh one of the topic ideas I send people is about doing a designer spotlight where we like talk about a game designer and, you know, discuss some of our favorite games and like what makes that game designer kind of special and, you know, what's signature about their games. And we haven't done one yet until I emailed Ryan and Ryan's favorite topic on the list that I sent him was the designer spotlight and there was yeah. a particular designer that you wanted to spotlight that's true you want me to go ahead and spoil it yes spoil uh, it well, first of all i will say I, I do i just liked like i like giving credit to designers and i like looking at a like a, a designer's catalog right like there's just something special i think about watching uh how a designer's designs innovate over time the designer uh, that's very close to my heart whose games i love that's vital lacerda no big surprise to people who watch the channel uh, <laughs> because we did our big top 50 games. And then 
I had almost every one of his games appeared somewhere on my top 50, some higher than others, obviously. So I always jump at a chance to talk about Lacerda's games and also just to bring people into them because I would love to see more people playing Lacerda's games and not just getting intimidated by hearing his name when it comes to uh, a, a board <laughs> yeah. game. Yeah. Yeah, so today so today we're talking about board games designed by Vital Lacerda, you know, just kind of highlighting what makes them special, what makes them challenging. And of course, we'll also kind of share some of our favorite Lacerda games. Yes. I will say up front, like I have played a good chunk of Lacerda games, but I do not consider myself to be an expert by any means, but I was just very excited to have this conversation because I really appreciate Vital Lacerda as a game designer and yeah. his games. And I also was excited that you're so excited about his games. So I'm like, I want to talk to you about it. So so here we are going to be talking about some <laughs> Lacerda games. But, uh, Absolutely. <laughs> but before we start talking about Lacerda games, I'd love to hear what you've been playing lately, Ryan. So let's jump into Fresh Plays. All right, so the game, like, uh, there's a lot. Gen Con just happened. We brought <laughs> right. back so many games. And so when you're asking me, like, what have you played recently that stood out? I, I, I'm going back and actually talking about games that came out of Gen Con that I absolutely love that I could play over and over again. The first one of those games is called Sky Team. Yes. This is from Luke, Luke Ramond and publisher The Scorpion Masque. This game is so much fun. Uh, it is a two-player cooperative game where you're a pilot and co-pilot trying to land a plane, um, which sounds, you know, like this is something they do every day. But it's it's a challenging dice placement game. And the real challenge is that you're not allowed to talk to the other player. Yeah, that it's a little bit off theme, but it does it makes the game <laughs> so engaging because you're placing dice down to do a wide variety of things in order to, to make sure that you're safe to land. You have to make sure that you're coming in at the right approach speed. You have to make sure that the, that you're uh, signaling ahead to the tower and that the runway is clear of planes. You have to make sure that your plane's angle is flat. You have to make sure that all the, the brakes are up, that the flaps are down. Like there's all this stuff that you have to manage and you're having to manage it all by, by placing dice down. And each player takes turns placing these dice. And in some cases, you add up the total. Some places you look at the difference. Some places you kind of work cooperatively. And every kind of uh, die has its own effect. And each player has their own tasks that they have to uh, excel at or they have to complete. And it's it's super fun. It's very thematic. And it's also very difficult. Uh, and you can start adding on these modules. There's modules where you have to worry about how much fuel is left in the plane. Uh, there's certain airports where you have to approach at different angles. Uh, so you have to make sure that your plane is like going through different angles at different times, which is very difficult to time. Uh, so there's just there's a lot of really cool tension in this game. And I've played it five times now, and it's been a blast every single time I've played it. Yeah, I have only played Sky Team once, but I'm going to tell you, I loved it. This is yeah. like this is like one of two regrets that I didn't take home <laughs> oh, from no. Gen Con. And it was only because they kept running out and uh, our BGG review copy went to Eric Martin because I think he's oh, going to probably... That Eric. <laughs> I think he's going to do a video <laughs> on it. And also, you know, we have some in the... We had some in the hot games room at Gen Con, which are going to the library. Which I could yeah. have borrowed one, but I'm just going to buy it because I thought that was just such a fantastic game. I did a demo of it with a um, a young kid and his dad was kind of helping him a little bit. But oh, it was just even that first scenario, like we ended up winning, but it was challenging the way it makes you think. And mm -hmm. I love the dice placement and I love the fact that there are all those different airports and everything like you're saying that, you know, you could make it progressively more challenging and yeah. just vary it up a bit. So and also I, that's cool. I, I know this is this is a podcast, so you can't see anything I'm talking about, but definitely go look at pictures and just look at how the board looks because the way that they've made that board kind of resemble the cockpit of an airplane and just <laughs> it just yeah. looks so it immediately draws you into the theme. Yeah, the great, great pick. I cannot wait to play more Sky Thank Team. You. I agree. Um, I think that's just it's fantastic. Um, and that's why it was the, one of the games that was like selling out everything, like yeah, every day, every first morning, day. Yep. you know? So 
I've been uh, trying to play a lot because I was like kind of making up for lost time since I was sick after Gen Con. And um, there's so many games like you, like you're saying that were like have been memorable and, you know, that I just like enjoyed that I I would I want to talk about, but um, I'll talk about them more over time. Um, Mm -hmm. But like, for example, For some reason, Nemesis popped up on my radar when I was at Gen Con, and I don't remember why. I don't remember why, but I remember talking to Steph Hodge about it because I know um, she likes it a lot, and then she kind of like was telling me some stories, and it got me excited (laughs) about it. So one of the things, like when I was sick, I became sort of obsessed with Nemesis. Oh, nice. Yeah, and I was just watching a lot of like solo playthroughs. I was watching rules videos. I ended up tracking down a copy, which I bought, and now I have it. And I have played a games, and I I, I love it already. Um, but I'm not talking about Nemesis. I could also <laughs> <laughs> I'm not talking about Nemesis because I want to play it more, and at some point I'll talk you more should, about and, it. Yeah, I get it because the new one is coming out yeah, coming soon. Yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm getting in on that. I'm like now I'm uh-huh. I'm, I'm late to the party with Nemesis, but I'm I'm getting in on that. Uh, but yeah, I, it kind of made me realize how much like I love these like kind of like semi cooperative games where there's like yeah. maybe some backstabbing happening. It, that just excites me personally. Then I started Frost Haven, which the day that we had this hurricane in L.A., uh, oh, wow. our good friends Cassie and Jake came over and we were start. We started our campaign of Frost Haven. It was a very slow game because we were all like relearning the rules. We only had like a little bit of Jaws of the Lion experience. But anyway, like I said, I want to I'll talk about that later down the line when we're a little bit like further through um, playing it. But fantastic time very excited about that then i also played great western trail new wow. zealand recently oh, I, did, I did too it was so good uh, it's so good it's so good but i always gush about great western trail on Me this too. podcast I, I love so, it. so i was like i'm not gonna talk about that and then the other thing that i'm not gonna talk about is there's a lot we're not talking I know. about today oh yeah we're not we're not talking about these things at all but <laughs> gaia project is on mm, my mind yep. So, like, back in the day when I got into Terra Mystica, I had played Gaia Project only once, and I had kind of a wonky experience with it. I think the teach wasn't great. We didn't even finish the game. Like, there were some weird things, but at the time, I kind of remember just walking away being like, I like the theme of Terra Mystica better. So, <laughs> sure. you know, just totally forgot about this game. Then, of course, I the week before Gen Con, I played Terra Nova, which got me excited about Terra Mystica yep. again. Got Age of Innovation. Love yes, that. Got me yes. even more excited. So I'm like, I need to try Gaia Project. So got Gaia Project to the table solo. And oh, my goodness, I have it has not left my brain. I'm so excited mm-hmm. about like kind of like getting into that now. Another one I'm late to the party with. But I'm not talking about Gaia Project, Ryan. <laughs> Guess what I'm right. talking about? Well, I can because you told me before we filmed. So <laughs> I'm not I'm not going to guess. But I don't think I would have ever – I can tell you, you I would have never guessed this. <laughs> nor that I would have never guessed that this type of game would really appeal to you. So maybe there's a side of you as a gamer Ooh, that I just yeah. wasn't aware of yes. before right now. You're, you're going to learn that I love historical strategy games and war games. And I played – I guess I'm trying to think of the timing, not last week and the weekend before an epic game of here I stand, which is a 2006 release designed by Ed Beach from GMT games, two to six player, like epic card driven game that covers like the political and religious conflicts of the early 16th century Europe. And it's like basically a six way struggle for power and influence with these six different factions during the Protestant reformation. There are, I, I like I've been so excited to play this game for so long um, because in my head, just from videos and reading about it, I'm like, this is historical TI4. And I like I love TI4. I love <laughs> TI4. I love historical <laughs> games. So I'm like, I want this experience. Um, so I finally like I scheduled this like two months out. I got six people together. Uh, including myself. Oh, a full six player count. Full six player count. Like this is the way I heard. This is the way to play this, this is game. The way. And and now after playing it, I am a believer that this is the way to play right, the we'll game. Set up a game and br- bring me in. I want to. I want to get in on this. Yeah, yeah. I think you would love it. Actually. Uh, wait, are you a TI four fan? 
Or do you like the like, big, big uh, epic uh, uh, games? I love TI4. I already love, I love GMT games. I love coin games. So I feel like I can oh, find a lot goodness. to love here. Yes. Yeah. So you are, you are definitely going to like love this, but basically one player plays the Ottomans, one player plays the Habsburgs, one player's the English, another the French, another the Papacy. That was me. And then uh, another <laughs> the Protestants. And first of all, let's, let me just say how I decided I was like, Hey, I'm going to be the papacy. And I told two sets of friends who were playing this separately. And immediately both of the, or two people were like, okay, that means I'm going to be the Protestants. Like they just wanted to go head to head with me. Uh, and I was wow. like, wow, friends. Wow. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, in the game, you have these like six, like asymmetric factions, like each one, like you can automatically win this game. If you get to 25 victory points, boom, win the game. Um, but otherwise, each faction kind of has their own way of that they can auto win the game. And also each faction has its own kind of like menu of actions, kind of like similar to a uh, a coin game in that sense. And the way it is with like these six different factions, the way they all like work together. First of all, this is like more of a political game, I would say, than a war game. Like there were battles that popped off. And there's like some dice chucking and everything. And I was battling uh, my friend Drew, who's the Protestant player, uh, which is kind of like, you know, there's there's dice rolling. So you got to sure. be OK with that if you're going to play this game. But it's like I'm doing this like where I'm worried about the Protestants kind of taking over. Um, the English and French are kind of concerned about each other. The Habsburgs are kind of like in the middle of everything. The Ottomans are doing all this like pirating different areas to kind of like meet their goals. And one of the coolest things about this game is that there is a diplomacy phase every round. And in our game, only one play, one person had played this game before. And he played like a handful of times years ago. And the rest sure. of us were all newbies. And so the first diplomacy phase, like, especially if you're new, you know, is kind of like quick, like you think of like blood on the clock terror, you get up and you go, you could talk to people, you can make some, um, deals because before you do the diplomacy phase you get a hand of cards so this is like a card driven game a la twilight struggle um so everybody is getting cards from the same deck and you get a different amount of cards depending on like the progress of your faction so when you get to this diplomacy phase you can make deals to give people cards and cards are like driving your action and fueling how much you can do each turn so they're very important Wow. So, yeah, so I made <laughs> I made some deal with um, my friend Ben, who was the English player who was looking to get a divorce because, as <laughs> he said, he was playing the wifey game in this. <laughs> um, but he needed to get a divorce and he needed my permission. Like I had to OK it. So I had him give me, I think, two cards that round. And I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll give you the divorce. And, you know, we're having these side conversations. Interesting. Yeah. But so then it's negotiation. Absolutely. Absolutely. You can form like official alliances with people. So after you do this like diplomacy phase, you come back to the table and everybody goes around the table announcing like the outcome, like, hey, I, I'm in an alliance with the French. And then and then it would keep going around the table. And then the French player would have to, when it got to them, also say, I'm in an alliance. I'm in an alliance with the papacy or whatever, or whoever I am. Sure. So you have to like validate like they could backstab you and say no i'm oh, not boy. Ha, ha, ha you know did oh, you backstab anyone candace i did not no i'm not that kind of player <laughs> no often. You, you hold to your deals <laughs> yeah i hold to my deals but it like but by the time we hit the third round diplomacy phase it was so spicy ryan like i bet people that i would never expect to be talking <laughs> and whispering to each other in the corner were whispering and out the outcome of this whole phase, like, and you're just like, okay, well, I can see this person is might be set up to win, so we have to work together to stop that, you know. And it's like yeah. one of, one of those games, and but everybody's having these conversations, and I just remember my brain tingling so much from just the way the politics and the interaction was working at that point. Like it was like things are clicking, things people are understanding how the game works, and then. After that round, the Habsburgs, the player who was the most experienced, ended up coming out of that uh, diplomacy phase, making deals with 
everyone. He had 11 cards. <laughs> he, I don't know what he was telling people, but he came out with 11 cards where everybody else probably had five or less. And wow. He, so did he win? He did. He did. And we were not <laughs> sure. We kept being like, we knew he was a threat because he just knew more about it. <laughs> But we weren't sure how he could pull it off. And then all of a sudden we saw him taking different regions because one of the ways you can get points to your auto victory is like taking over these key political spaces. And we were like, oh, okay, he's about to win. And like at that point, Uh I don't think there was anything we could do to stop him. So the game ended at like at at the end of round four, I would say. And I I forget how many turns it can go to, maybe like nine if it goes the full way. Um, oh, wow. And it so was about half the, about half the time. Yeah. And I've heard like it can end early often, uh, but you should kind of like plan a whole day for it. How long was your game? I want to say we, we got into it around like one o'clock and that probably was, it was probably done by like six thirty or seven. So that was like four or five hours. Yeah. And that we only experienced half the game. Yeah. Yeah, like wow. this is like you have to plan a day for this game. I was expecting them for it to go to like 11 p.m. That's that. Wow, that's wild. I'd love that. I love yeah. that though. So so it was like it was cool that it ended early, especially like I like when that happens for a first game because it's like it's kind of more of a learning game. Everybody got used yeah. to like seeing how different things work. Now I'm ready to come back and I want to try a different faction. And yeah, so anyway, it's called Here right, I Stand. It. Yeah, yeah, we should we should try to afford like at a, a convention together, especially like yeah, just start the day early, come the day before, and just do a whole long yes. day of it. That yes, would be fun. I would love it. And yes, yeah, six players. But yeah, I can't wait to play that again. I also want to try Virgin Queen, which was like the kind of sequel to this game. Oh, nice. But yeah, here I stand. Epic game. What else have you been playing lately, Ryan? All right. Well, the other one I wanted to talk about, because I, I, again, came from Gen Con, and this was my number one game of Gen Con. And spoiler alert, this might end up being one of my number one games of the year. This is Barcelona from Danny Garcia and Borden Dice. This game is is phenomenal uh, in, in so many ways. Uh, I just want to you know start by saying that, that Danny Garcia, the designer, obviously has a lot of love for the city. Because this, the, the, the design of this game and just like the thematic idea behind this game is all rooted in the actual history of the city. And what you're doing in the game, the actions you're taking, all have actual historical significance. So I didn't know any of this before I started playing the game. But I love when I walk out of a play and I feel like I learned something. And yeah. I learned that like Barcelona was like one of the most uh, defensible cities in Europe. And it had these giant walls and like they had a law, like you could not build outside of them. So Barcelona just kept growing. It kept growing inside these walls and the population was starting to suffer because they couldn't fit. So they had this guy, uh, Serda, who they brought in, they, they tore down the walls and he kind of planned an expansion to Barcelona. And I, again, this is crazy. Wow. He, he kind of invented... Uh, urbanism or like the block system that we use today where you lay down your roads in a grid and you, you know, build in the middle and you have all these like square routes. Like that was invented by wow, him. Wow, that's so cool. Uh, and Bar- yeah. And Barcelona was one of the first places to do that. And he was very forward thinking. He left room for streets to be wide enough because he foresaw things like uh, like trams coming. He foresaw like automobiles. He saw like that transportation was going to become so important. So he had these extra wide streets that let people like walk. Like, so he had sidewalks. Yeah. It's just crazy to me that this is, that this all came out of Barcelona. And so you're replicating this, uh, in a, in a very neat way that you have like this new section, um, of, of Barcelona and you're, you're building buildings in there and you're, you're kind of taking, um, workers out of a bag and there's these different colored workers. And there's a whole system to the game where you place the workers down in an intersection of the city. And each intersection, like picture, you know, a city street divided into blocks. You follow the street, uh, pair like to the left and up, and then you see which actions you're in the middle of, and you get to take both actions. Ah. And then there's a diagonal that shoots through, so you can potentially put it in such a place that you get to take three actions. And this is one of your one of those games where when you take an action, sometimes you get to place like a bonus tile that lets you take another action. So you're playing a turn where you might be taking four or five actions in a turn 
building up Barcelona, getting in-game scoring tiles, um, moving your trams around the city, and ultimately building buildings. Because at the end of your turn, you look at all of the people that have been placed in all these different intersections, and you can remove them in order to place building tiles here. Uh, and again, this cool. is super interesting because uh, Serta, like had this plan for the city that every block was going to be two sides of the block were going to be buildings and the whole rest was going to be like parks and gardens and places for people to walk. Well, we know that that isn't what happened because we see how our cities look. (laughs) And so you can actually gain or lose favor with Serta throughout the game. If you build these like small level buildings in these, in these grids that are just like two sides, you get points with him. He gives you favor. But you can build these giant, like, you know, apartment complexes effectively and just completely cover that space, which he doesn't like that. You actually lose points with Serta. And every scoring phase, you get points for doing a specific thing multiplied by how high you are on that Serta track. So if you've been playing in such a way that you appease Serta, like, and it's such a satisfying puzzle to try to solve, like, to try to figure that out. Like, and there's multiple scoring phases and the way that scoring happens is very dynamic. So uh, it's just, it's such a fun, satisfying game. It's one of those games where, you know, the, your first turn, you might score like five or six points, but at the end of the game, you might be scoring like 30 or 40 points on a turn, wow. uh, which I, I really like that <laughs> nice. ramped. Yeah. It's, it just, it hits all those like combo buttons for like a Euro gamer like myself who loves that. Like, oh, you, you do this. It lets you place a tile. The tile you covered gives you another action. You get to draw this thing from a bag. I drew a Combos. token. That's another action. Yes. Like, combo rific. It's so good. <laughs> That's and I think, I mean, awesome. they, they sold out at Gen Con too. Yeah. So uh, hopefully people are out playing that. And if you haven't played that, you you have to play that, Candice. It's, I have it's not played so it yet. It's so good. Yeah. I actually, like, I think it was the last day of Gen Con. I stopped by uh, Borden Dice's booth and talked to Rainer about it. And I was already, like, kind of intrigued because, yeah. like you're saying, the designer, it's based on like something that happened historically where he's from. And um, and it just like looks beautiful. Like it has a really nice oh, table yeah. presence. Oh, yeah. I didn't so. even mention that. Yeah. Yeah. It looks it looks phenomenal. And my favorite thing is uh, in the rule book, actually, he kind of broke down. He's got little sidebars all throughout the rule book that said, look, this is how it actually happened. Like That's this cool. thing that you're putting down, the way, the way you're building the streets, this was they started building streets. They started That's cool. installing trams. Like it's, it, I like having that historical background yeah. for like what I'm actually doing in the game. Plus, I think it just makes the game easier to understand mechanically oh, yes. when they actually like tell you thematically what you're doing as well. Totally. Like that's, that's really helpful. And, and that kind of makes sense now that I realize that you love like coin games and GMT games and everything, I do because I, do, I love yeah. that in historical games too, where they're telling you a, explaining a mechanism and then they'll pop up a box like, Hey, here's a designer note of why this is working this way. Right. But that's, that's really cool. Yeah. I have not played Barcelona yet, but I, um, it, it's on my list to check it out. And I've, have a couple of friends locally who have played it and one in particular like really really likes it um yeah. so i'm definitely curious about it especially because um yeah just the, everything you just said it's, it's yeah <laughs> it's just it's just sad it's just satisfying at the end of the day yeah really cool so that's barcelona yeah barcelona oh so the so the next game i'm going to tell you about is actually like not something that's maybe traditionally in my wheelhouse or i'm 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 learning that it might not be my favorite mechanism, but a lot of people kind of love it. And um, I'm going to tell you about a game I recently played called Lands of the Mesozoic. Uh, this is a oh. this is a new game. It's not even out yet. I I was uh, sent a prototype from the publishing company. I think it is it's on Kickstarter right now, and it's going to be out. I assume sometime next year. But this is a dinosaur tableau builder uh, in the vein of Wingspan uh, designed by Ander Guinea. And it's published by Pungo Games, which is this new label uh, within Worthington Publishing, who traditionally I think does mostly like war games. Um, But they have this new series of games or this new label that's family focused, like Euro games kind of. And um, so anyway, they had this like, so this, 
I read the description of this and I was like, yeah, I'll check it out. This like this sounds interesting. And I I don't know. I guess I like dinosaurs. Like <laughs> I I do too. <laughs> yeah, like there's something I I like about something dinosaurs. About yeah, so that that theme kind of appealed to me. Um so this game is uh, one to four players and it's definitely again like something that's a little lighter in the vein of something like Wingspan or Earth. Yeah. Um but you are basically building and maintaining an ecosystem with all these different dinosaurs and on your turn so you'll have you'll start the game with like a hand of different cards and there there are land cards, there are herbivore cards, there are carnivore cards. Um, and you'll start a, the game with a couple of each. And on your turn, you can play cards into your tableau. And you have this like board that, again, reminds me of like Wingspan because it's a big old player board where you'll be playing your cards onto. But you can play cards, you know, assuming you can pay the cost. And then any cards that you haven't exhausted, you can kind of exhaust them, um, tap them, rotate them to tap, use, ex- yeah. to use their abilities. Um, so when you play land cards, the cost is just simply to discard cards. Like you might need to discard two cards to play this land card. And I think there are like five or six different types of lands. So you play those by paying cards into the discard pile. And then like with herbivores, which they're the second row up on your player board from the bottom, um, because the herbivores need the land to kind of like feed off of. So when you play those, you need to, the cost is going to be usually discarding some cards, but also you need to exhaust a type of land, a specific type of land that they need to like live in or feed off of. Um, And then go working your way up the next row on your board is where you're going to play carnivore cards. And in order to play carnivore cards, you're going to need to usually tap herbivore cards like they need to kind of like oh, feed off like of the those food chain. Yeah, yeah there's like there's a food chain element to it and it's kind of hard to play carnivores because they can be um a little more powerful too so you're kind of like building up such that you can eventually get these carnivores out there but um the different cards have a variety of effects like you can exhaust them to trigger abilities such as drawing more cards uh, one of the cool things about the game is that when you draw cards, you can either draw from the top of the discard pile or the or the top of the draw deck. So you are thinking about when you discard cards, which you do a lot because you're paying for cards yeah. by discarding cards, um, which <laughs> the, the order in which you're discarding them, you're kind of thinking about like, oh, I don't want to like throw my opponent something good maybe, or maybe I want to <laughs> right. discard this to the top so maybe I can eventually get it back myself. You know, those those kind of decisions. But some of the card effects also will make your uh, your cards go extinct, like the land and the dinosaurs. So um, on your player board, you also have this pile where you'll keep face down cards, which you'll score at the end of the game. And the goal of this game is to have the most victory points after you play through three different periods. And um, so you get at the beginning of the game, you'll have uh, one, you choose one of two personal, like private goal cards. And then there's one that's going to be a public, like a shared goal card at that you play. So like, like a different shared goal every game. And these goals are like, again, it reminds me of something like Earth, I think, where. Oh, yeah, that's a good comparison. Yeah, where yeah. you like, OK, you get two points per a card that has this kind of cost on it or per dinosaur that has this tag on it, you know, different things like that. So you'll have one personal goal for yourself that nobody knows about. And then you'll have a, a shared goal. In addition to that, you have these race goals, which are like a more like public objectives that you can score. Like if you, when, when you have five land cards in play, you know, the first person to do that gets a two point token Second person gets a one point token. So you're kind of like racing each other to fulfill little objectives like that. Um, One of the things I think would have been like a little bit more interesting is if they made those goals variable, but they're kind of just like hard printed on the board. Like every game, there are these five things you're racing to, Um, which I love stuff like that, like in uh, Terraforming Mars, where you're racing Mm -hmm. to get some kind of objectives. But after you play, you know, you alternate taking turns and then you, um, after I think it, it it does like a wingspan thing, um, not with the actions. Actually, I'm trying to think. It does. 
I'll tell you, I'll explain it. And then you, like, it reminds me of the thing in Wingspan where each round you get less actions. So each period in this game, we play three periods. Yeah, it's the same idea, actually. You get get less (laughs) actions the whole time. So the first period, I think maybe you get like seven or eight actions that you'll do. And then the next period you get five and then, you know, or maybe it goes down to five. I don't remember. But like each period you get right, less dwindling actions. actions yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. And at the end of period one and period two, there's a major extinction event. And that is like one of the twists to the game, because at that point, you're going to flip a major extinction card. But before that, you have to make your uh, like you have to discard down to a certain amount of cards in your hand, you have to discard cards or make cards on your your tableau extinct. So it, initially, that could seem like, oh, well, why is I, I don't like that? You know, I'm losing everything I just yeah. built up. But I think like it's kind of something you can plan around and use it to your advantage because in order to you know you only have so many slots that you can place cards, and different types of dinos want different cards, and maybe. That's freeing up spaces so you can kind of rethink how you want to build up. So it's kind of like a slight reset, but you get to kind of control what's going extinct and everything. So I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah. And um, yeah, I think like, I think people who like tableau builders, and that's why I'm like realizing like, I'm, I think I'm just not like a big tableau builder person. It, it, they're, I'm 50-50. It just yeah. it really depends on the, it depends. There are some tableau builders I love. But there are so many that I don't love that I don't think I can ever just flat out say, oh, yeah, it's a tableau builder. I'm, I'm good for it. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. So this is like for people who love dinosaurs, definitely check this out because I'm going to mm-hmm. tell you the art is like so cool. Like there's so many cards in this game and I have never even heard of so many of these different types of dinosaurs. So it was like really cool just like trying to pronounce the names and and looking at the art on the cards and everything. And it, it it is definitely like more of a multiplayer solitaire game. So I know some people are into that. Some people are not into yeah. that. But um, that is one thing to consider. But definitely worth checking out if you're like someone who likes tableau builders or likes dinosaurs or likes to play games that are in that like like more wingspan kind of weight. Um, it's called Lands of the Mesozoic and it'll be on Kickstarter through September 2023. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested in this uh, just for my four-year-old. He's in a huge dinosaur phase right oh, now. So even yeah. if he doesn't, he knows all of the dinosaurs. So even if I can't play this game with him, just having a bunch of cards, I'm looking at the artwork right now that yeah. it does look really cool. I think just having this uh, for him to grow into would, would be a lot of fun. Totally, totally. Um, yeah, that's that's a great card or great ca- card. Great call because it's the same thing like with wingspan cards too. It's just like that's yeah. just so cool mm-hmm. to look through all those cards and you know check out the and birds. Learn about birds. Yeah. yeah. And now a word from our sponsor. Legends only grow. Descent Legends of the Dark is the definitive dungeon crawling app assisted board game experience. While playing Descent, players make decisions throughout the campaign that alter the paths their heroes walk, allowing them to grow throughout their adventures in ways unique to each playthrough. With tons of abilities spread across dozens of weapons and skills, one of Descent's most fun and iconic aspects is working together with your party to discover powerful synergies and new ways to explore and even exploit the game's robust systems. The Betrayer's War, the second act of Descent, picks up where the first act left off and introduces another full-length campaign with an expanded roster of allies and enemies. The heroes have a fresh arsenal of skills and weapons along with new legend cards that represent permanent choices the players make to shape their hero's growth. The second act also has even more structures, dozens of new detailed figures, and a towering and tremendous model of the sinister Dragonlord Leverax. Let's move on to talking about the tall Lacerda. Yes. So I'm excited to be talking about Lacerda with you, Ryan, because you yeah, know, me too. clearly you are like a big fan. And I would say definitely <laughs> like I, yeah. I, I'm, a, I'm a fan myself, too. But I'm definitely, again, not probably nearly as experienced with Lacerda games as you are. But I do find a lot of joy in them. And um, yeah. 
you know, so I, I would kind of like for people who aren't familiar with the tall Lacerda games, like these are like heavy thematic games. The, they are. They, they are very. So this is what I always say about Lacerda games. And, and uh, I think a lot of people are scared of them because, yeah, they, they are very heavy. They are very complex. They can take up to potentially three hours long. And there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of interconnecting decisions. So yeah. the heaviness really comes in like. What what decisions do I make? But what I also love about the sort of games is what you're actually doing in the game is fairly simple. A lot of these are just like worker placement games, and if you know how to place a worker and take the action, so they're they're they're, they're actually probably easier to approach than people think they are because you get so bogged down in hearing about all this complexity, which is what I love. I love that depth. I love you, yeah. know, you have so many tight decisions, but at the end of the day, and and Lacerda himself. Uh, has said this. He actually he got uh, taught me Lisboa way back when Lisboa came out. He said oh, that's so his cool. games are so. He said his games are so simple. He doesn't understand why people call them complicated because it's like all you do all you do is play a card. Play a card. That's it. <laughs> that's it. That's all you're doing. You're just playing a card. And it's like sure that that's like in on Mars. All you're doing is placing a worker. Yeah. But there's but there's so many options. Yeah. And there's always like these you know bonus actions or executive actions you can take and. Like that kind of complexity, um, it just works really well for me. I like having all these different paths to victory, all these different combos you can create, these different levers you can pull on. They, they just come together for me uh, in a really satisfying way. Yeah, and I, I completely agree. Like that's one of the first things I think about when I think about Lacerda games, especially like the heavier big box ones, is that like you usually don't have that many actions, you usually don't have that many yeah. rounds, but like that yeah. that that one or two actions just lead to like so many really fascinating brain burnery like choices. And yeah. and and I think I don't know what percentage, but like majority of them, especially most of the ones coming out these days, all have um, the gorgeous Ian O'Toole artwork oh, and yeah. <laughs> graphic design. Yes. Oh my goodness! I, I hope that I hope that Vital is out there, you know, counting his lucky stars every day <laughs> that he got paired up with Ian O'Toole. Yeah, um, because these these games are good, but like uh, this partnership that that Ian O'Toole and Lacerda and Eagle Griffin have. Oh yeah, it's phenomenal. The production value is always out of this world, and then Ian O'Toole's covers are just iconic. Yeah, I mean, like yeah, they're the and anything he does, uh, not just the stuff he does with Lacerda, but anything he does is amazing. Mm -hmm. But there's just something to say. Like we have this masterpiece of a game that now to me has been really elevated by masterpiece artwork and graphic on top design. of it for yeah. sure. Well, yeah, and, and you know, Tool does a lot of the graphic design too. Like yeah. he's like he is brilliant, and so yeah, I mean, it, it's just a match made in heaven for me. Totally, totally, and like I think one of the things that like has because as I look at my list, so we but we both picked like our favorite four Lacerda games. Yep, and <laughs> I realized that like I've played I don't know maybe seven or eight of these games. But there's only one Lacerda game that I've played multiple times. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. And I oh, and I think oh. yeah, I, they're challenging to get to the table. But from the one that I have played multiple times, I can say it's so rewarding, and it feels like things like you almost have to play mm -hmm. them multiple times so that it kind of you clicks. Do. And you can like, you do. yeah, so that's like, that's kind of a, again, like I'm not an expert here, but like, I can just tell you as an appreciator of board games and like just game design, like I'm, every one that I've played has been like really, really fascinating and cool. So it was actually <laughs> quite hard to, to make the list, which we'll go over in a minute. This is true. <laughs> Um, well, it was hard for me to actually cut down to four. So we had, <laughs> we both we had, had opposite struggles. struggles here. So <laughs> we'll see how they compare. Yeah. And, and one of the other things, Ryan, we were kind of talking about it earlier is how, you know, uh, a lot of what Lacerda does are these like big, heavy games. Yeah. But um, there are a few games that he's done. He's mm, partnered yep. up with other designers to create these like what I call Lacerda light games. Which that's are a good, yeah, that's a good name. <laughs> which are kind of thanks, which are kind of like really helpful for kind of introducing people to some of these mechanisms that you'll find in the bigger games. So it's like like Mercado de Lisboa, 
You know, this is a, a, a thinky filler game that's based off of one aspect of Lisboa, and that one is co-designed by uh, Julian Pombo, who also designed Pompero, which is a really cool yeah. game too. Yeah, I've, I've played that one a couple times. Yeah, so. yeah, but it's like he he they took the two of them like took um, one element of uh, one like one part of Lisboa and said, "Let's break this mm-hmm. into a new game so people can just understand how that part of this you know bigger, more complex beast of a game kind of works." And then uh, he worked with um, Joa Quintella Martins to create That's good. Bot Factory. Did I do okay there? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> um, for Bot Factory, which is, again, like a kind of stripped down version of Kanban, um, mm-hmm. which is like, you know, you're, you're gathering projects and parts and assembling these robots, but it's a like worker placement game where you have to kind of um, you have this factory manager that's kind of moving around and using different spaces, you know, and causing havoc. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's uh, it, it, and it's good that they've like, you know, you mentioned this, they, they kind of took a, the, the main aspect, something that's very prevalent in those games to focus on. And I thought Bot Factory did a really good job of like kind of teaching you not just how like the car mechanism in combat works, but actually like the fact that Sandra moves from space to space and does yeah, something, yeah. which is a huge part of uh combat. They actually managed to kind of boil that down into something a lot more accessible that when you then play bot factory and then go on to Kanban, you kind of already have a pretty good understanding of how that works. Yeah. And I actually, I played like a prototype. I, I did a play test of uh bot factory feel what feels like forever ago. Um, but I actually haven't, actually played the the finished version so i'm gonna have to check that out yeah. and then there's one coming next year right yeah house of fado and i uh this one i have not played uh, i did get to uh see this i actually i went to a retreat earlier this year and got to play some of lacerda's uh, newer games cool. um he was there kind of teaching and he had house of fado there as well i did not get to play it um because i was busy i was playing um speakeasy which is his new one coming out next year uh, so I, 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 that was like a long one so that you could play multiple games of House of Fado, but House of Fado <laughs> was based on the gallerist. Um, so you're not, you're not bringing in artists, you're actually bringing like musicians into your restaurant to perform. So again, similar mechanisms to the gallery, similar idea of like, you want these famous performers to come in, but like done in a, in a small box kind of way. Yes. Totally. So, yeah. so I would say let, let's jump into our top four here, which I know is just like incredibly challenging. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah we'll, we're, we're going to do it anyway. And, and I, I, okay. I would say let, let's do the thing where, you know, I'll, we'll start with you. And if, if you say the title of the game, if, if it's on my list, we will, if it's higher on my list, like we'll we'll pivot and sure. talk about it later. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you can you you can tell. Well, tell me because uh, the first game on my list, the number four for me is Kanban EV. Did that make it on your list? Um, uh, wait. Let me get to my list. Actually, Uh-oh. actually, it is also my it number is. four. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I guess we can just kind of uh, rope these together. Yes. But, uh, Kanban uh, <laughs> came out in uh, twenty twenty. Of course, this is again let's start it with Ian O'Toole. Uh, Kanban EV, one of the most uh, iconic covers. Uh, and this is actually a reprint. He did Kanban years ago before he kind of had this like Eagle Griffin style with Ian O'Toole. He had done Kanban and then he reprinted Kanban with the Kanban EV, which added in some extra elements uh, to like bring it more in line with, you know, what we expect from a Lacerda game these days. But there's, yeah. ugh, there's so much going on in Kanban. Like you're, you're effectively running a car factory um designing cars but you have to you know get the blueprint for the car you have to develop the car you have to make the car you have to test drive the car uh you have to do all this stuff at the same time (laughs) that sandra that i talked about in bot factory she comes along in bot factory and kind of helps you out in kanban she goes from department to department evaluating your performance judging you judging you (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. She's micromanaging everything you do in this factory. And so if you have not performed a specific action well enough, then she will grade you poorly and you'll lose victory points. 
but it's a worker placement game and the, the, it's like a line and Sandra moves up that line. And so there's this interesting blocking mechanism where if there's no space for Sandra in a department, she will skip it. So if you have, an, <laughs> if you and another player can kind of, you know, collude with each other, you can place your workers in such a way that Sandra will just skip over you and you can breathe a sigh of relief. Like, okay, we have some time until yeah. she comes back around to this department now. <laughs> and that is a very interesting part of that game. Yeah, it it I find it to be such a puzzly like worker placement kind of yeah. time management system when you're like, yeah, you're you're kind of worried about Sandra. You're trying to like bump up your training in the different departments. Mm-hmm. And, you know, again, I feel like we're gonna say this with every game we talk about, but the production quality and the art. And just the layout of the board is so cool. And it's, very again, very thematic, very well yeah. integrated, you know. So my my funny story real quick with Kanban, I actually, this is this is the one that I've played multiple times, by the way. Oh, and it still ended up at, f- at four. Yeah, okay. yeah. Well, because I, I made my list based on the fact that I had a hard time, like, parsing which one I like best because yeah. I haven't played them all that much, but I did it based on what I'm most excited to play about play right now. Like, so if you were like, we're going to play one, a Lacerda game tonight, sure, sure. I That's put, fair. yeah. So I, I kind of, I kind of did it like that. Um, but I, I definitely like love Kanban EV. I played the old Kanban once before mm-hmm. had a really, that was actually my first time playing Lacerda and I had a really bumpy experience because yeah. the the people who were teaching it to us um, were really excited to show it to us, but did not remember how it worked. And so, oh boy, that's it, a problem. And I yeah. had no idea. I looked on the back of the box and I was like, oh, cars, this looks fun. You know, yeah. I had no so, idea what a Lucerta game meant at that point. So, sure. I, yeah, I don't think anybody really did actually right? back then. So, so, so it was kind of a, a train wreck. And then Kanban EV comes out. Eagle Griffin sent me a review copy of it. I I played it and I, you know, and I was like, okay, I'm going to play it again because I was like writing about it. So I wanted to play it like multiple times. And like that was like that forced me to get it to the table more. And the more I played it, the more it kind of felt not that complex to me. Like it just like yeah. was clicking. So I decided one day to that I was going to like have my partner Matt play and my friend Jake. I'm like, come play this game. It's so cool. It's not, you know, it's not that bad. Trust me. You know, but what I realized, like similar to my spice tolerance, like I, I have a different spice tolerance than a lot of people. And what something that does not seem spicy to me, it can be very spicy to a lot of people. So I had that moment with this game where I was like, I had played it like three times. So, you know, I'm grooving with it. it. It's not feeling all that complex to me. And I was like, you guys should play this. And, you know, they've played like viticulture tuscany you know they played work yeah. placement games but nothing quite this heavy and it broke them a little bit <laughs> oh, nice <laughs> yeah so they're 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 terrified and now they are those people who every time i say like hey you want to play this game they go on bgg and they're like i don't know the complexity rating says ah, three point blah, blah, blah. <laughs> i'm like come point, on four point I'm three like, on, trust on me like if somebody teaches yes. you it's not that bad <laughs> But anyway, I love Kanban EV for like all the reasons yeah. you kind of called out. Like the whole Sandra mechanism is like really, really cool. And then when she gets to the bottom of the track, when you have those like the board meetings and the everything. Score, yeah, the, the board meetings phase, and the scoring opportunities. Yeah. Super cool. Super cool. Well, and I, I, I'm, I'm really lucky in that I actually have a group of, of friends. Uh, my closest friends that I game with all are huge Lacerda fans. So I, I'm lucky in that. And we introduced um, Emily. Emily is one of the co-hosts on, on members. Yeah, People. yeah. If you haven't seen her stuff, she's fantastic. Uh, loves heavy games. And so we, she had never played Kanban. So we were like, you've got to. So we <laughs> yeah, introduced her to Kanban. Kanban. And it was one of those situations where it had been probably a year since we had played. So we're like fumbling through the rules a little bit because it's like, <laughs> yeah. they're so compl- you gotta relearn. complicated. Yeah. But she ended up beating us and we loved it so much. And we're like, we have to play this again while it's still fresh. So we actually played it like the next day That's awesome. again. And she crushed us again the second day in a row. I <laughs> uh, know it's like, she got it's it. one of her favorite. Oh, she got it. Like, it, like That's she got cool. it. Emily, That's awesome. Emily gets heavy games. Um, and so she crushed it actually. Uh, and it's one of her favorite games now. So I'm always a fan of playing Kanban EV. Yeah. And I think also, again, like if you're able to like learn a game like this, a low start a game and then play it, you know, within a week and keep keep, right. keep it fresh. 
like keep it in rotation, it'll be even more rewarding and like not feel as complex. Like it will just grind yeah, it for better. sure. For sure. Because yeah, you just, you just get into the motions and you kind of understand it. Yeah. Sometimes it takes the play. You, you mentioned this earlier and it does. Sometimes it takes a play to kind of, to kind of grasp it. And then you really want to play it again. So if you have a group, like, like I'm lucky enough to have that's willing to play these Lacerda games multiple times, we just find, we discover new things and new, new ideas or things yeah. that we didn't even really a- occur cool. to us uh, that we're learning like, you know, four or five plays in. So yeah. it's very awesome. And I, and I do, I do have, I, I have quite a few friends, you know, especially in, in the game rain guys, you know, sure. um, that are oh, big yeah, yeah. Lacerda fans, but it's just like, there's just so many games. So that makes it even more challenging sometimes mm-hmm. to get these to the table, but I'm going to make a better effort because, you know, <laughs> I know they're just so rewarding to play uh so what what so that is kanban ev that was kanban yep kanban ev so what's your number three all right so my number three is slightly heavier than that one uh it's on mars is that on your list that is not on my list all right so then i will talk about on mars um again when we're talking about our our favorite lacerda games like there's like kanban and on mars to me are so close um, I like On Mars, even though I think a lot of people might put it a little bit lower because there is a lot of added complexity to On Mars. There's a lot of small little rules that you really have to remember in On Mars that if you don't remember can really mess you up. Mm. But I've played it enough times now that it flows very easily. And I also, I, I absolutely love the theme. I uh, love yeah, space games. Cool. I love the idea of like being out there. Um, but what I really love about On Mars, and I've, have you played On Mars yes, at all? I yes, yes, I have okay. actually played it once. <laughs> so, so you'll you'll might remember this. Uh, one of the main tensions of the game is that you're you're colonizing, or I shouldn't say that you're building up Mars. Whatever you're building yeah. a colony on Mars, <laughs> and your your supplies are all being like delivered to a space station that's in the orbit. And there's a rocket that goes back and forth from the surface of Mars back to the space station. And so you have to go to the space station and you have to stock up on as many resources as you possibly can. And this includes getting blueprints for buildings, getting resources, getting some upgrades to your technology. And then you have to go back down to Mars and then try to spend it all. The The key thing here is that that, that shuttle takes time to go back and forth. And there's only one shuttle. So you could end up stuck on Mars with no resources mm. and nothing to do, or you could end up stuck up on the space station. You've spent all your money or whatever. You've got nothing left to spend. Not money, but you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you've spent everything. Um, and then you've got you've got nothing left to do up there. And then you're just stuck there waiting for the rocket ship to take you back to Mars. So the, this whole timing of when do you leave the surface, when do you come back to the surface, it's it's very strategic. And that, that tension... Um, it's really neat. It's just a really neat decision you have to make every time. Like, do I go with this rocket or do I wait for the next one? And you know, the next one could be three or four turns away before it actually reaches you. Yeah, it's, I remember really enjoying On Mars. And I think, you know, maybe I felt some of that extra complexity uh, because I was just like, I have a couple people that were, that I know that were playing this regularly, like every week on TTS or something, you know, and mm-hmm. I maybe at the time was like playing something where I was just like, it's so complicated. Like I would dread like kind of teaching this game. Um, I thought it was like, <laughs> sure. yeah, like it, it's, it's super cool though. And it, and, and I, because so many people love it so much, like it makes me want to re I'm going to revisit it at some point. Uh, but I was also curious, like, have you played the cooperative expansion for it yet? I haven't yet. I have it. It's just one of those things like it's just been sitting there. I haven't had time um, to play it because like like you said, it's it's always a lot of like call to the new here and getting back on Mars to the table. And it almost always feels like every time we play on Mars, we always have one new person at the table that's learning it. And so I was like, well, let's not introduce anything crazy for the right, first game. Right. And so like it always ends up happening that we just don't. Pick introduce it but i am actually i'm dying to play it's interesting there's aliens involved yeah. with it like it's very it's very different like on mars is like a pure like hardcore sci-fi <laughs> game and you've got these aliens coming uh but i i am uh really interested in playing the cooperative expansion yeah me too my my friend tim who often play tests with uh vital and uh so he is a big fan of these games and he was saying 
um, you know, on Mars is maybe not like his favorite of all the Lacerda games, but he really likes it a lot more with the co-op expansion. Yeah. So oh, really, I really want to try that. And yeah. it's obviously not my number one either. So, uh, but it did, it did get a place in the top four. A big part of that is theme. Uh, again, you know, Tool did a fantastic box cover, fantastic artwork on the game board. All the components are super nice. And it just, it, it feels when you make it work, when you get into the flow of on Mars of like, you know, you're, you're building these buildings, producing these resources, using these resources to buy things, to build more buildings, whatever. Yeah. Like you can get into a, into the zone and it really, it really feels good when you're in that sweet spot. Cool. Cool. So my number three is Lisboa. Oh, that, yeah, that's actually not on my list. It's not on your uh, list? It's not I'm so close, surprised. Close, close contender, <laughs> honestly. That I uh I did, between between my bottom my bottoms like uh on Mars, Kanban EV and, and Lisboa, those three are all so close to me. Yeah. Uh I really <laughs> struggled deciding which one not to put on. Well, and, that's okay, because now we can talk Lisboa about it anyway. It. Yeah, we can. <laughs> um yeah, so Lisboa came out in 2017. Eagle Griffin Games. This is, you know, another like iconic box cover. the The art style in this game is just like incredible and unique. Yeah, and but I think this was the first one, right? This was, wasn't this their first Vital, uh, with, you know, tool with collaboration. Anna tool. Um, it ba, might have ba, been. Ba, ba. <laughs> mm, I don't know. I put I you on the know. spot. I didn't do the research. I'm sorry. I, I actually possibly Vinos Deluxe was. Uh, was it, it might have been. Yeah. You might be right. But it is like it is a an er, a little bit of an earlier one, but I feel like this is like a lot of people's favorite and you know, I I think this was maybe the fourth uh the fourth uh Lacerda game that I played, but this one is basically about the reconstruction of Lisbon after the great earthquake of 1755 and it that earthquake kind of caused a tsunami and all these fires and it almost like completely destroyed the city and so this is another I think another like signature thing in a lot of uh Vital Serta games is that you know Vital is from Portugal and so a yeah, lot of right. these like real like historical or something uh Portugal related is in in the game and in this one, like our whole thing is that we're trying to like rebuild the city and of course score more victory points than our opponents. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot going on. You're like collecting these different sets of rubble cubes. You're getting points from like building these shops in this grid, which is um, that is like one of the core things that they pulled out this this grid where you can uh build these shops, open these shops, and then also like build these public buildings around it to score points. Um, that's the thing that they pulled into Mercado de Lisboa to show yeah. how that part of the board works. But like one of my favorite things about this game is that it is card driven by multi-use cards. And yes. I love multi-use cards and I love like having a hand of cards and being like, Ooh, what am I going to do? And like, basically on your turn, you're going to play one of these cards. Um, and you either have noble cards or you could have treasury cards and when you're deciding which card to play, you're also just deciding like how you want to play it. So you can play it either onto the main game board, which I think is called like the Royal Court, or you can tuck it in your player board or on your portfolio. And um, depending on the type of card you're tucking, um, if it's a treasury card, you'll tuck it in the bottom part of your player board. And then you'll get money based on like what the treasury level is. Another cool thing about the game, there's this like, treasury that kind of the value shifts and there are a lot of things in the games where you're making money or spending money based on th that uh that rate um or that value and you're also players are manipulating that that value so i love like you know kind of market manipulation mechanisms yeah and then also like i think that it's like it's it's really cool like <laughs> again like this is what you were talking about earlier like Simple game, right? You know, right, play a card right. on your turn. That's so all, easy. That's so all easy. you're doing. But like when you play a card on the main board, you're like, you're taking one of these three major actions, depending on which noble is on the card. And um, there are ways you can get these little tokens, these little, I forget yep. what they're called, but they let you, if you have a token, let's say I take the green noble action, 
um, you know, and you have a green token, you can do a follow action. There are also like all sorts of minor actions. Um, there's so much going on. Like you can, you can, uh, the top part of your board, you're tucking these ships, which you're using to sell goods and make money. And then the shops that are on the board, you're trying to produce goods and you're just like really developing this city. And then there's the whole, like the clergy kind of part of it. Ah, it's it's just yeah, it's, it's so interwoven beautifully. <laughs> right. That that complexity of, of like all that interconnectivity. But again, you mentioned earlier too, like this being like Portugal and this being something that's that's that Vital is passionate about. It really comes through in the theme. And the theme of of like cleaning up and like rebuilding Lisboa, like that that makes the game so much easier to grasp. Because like you have this full understanding thematically of like what yeah. you're doing and like how you're moving the game forward, uh, I think that was brilliant. Yeah, yeah. So Lisboa is, I would say, because um, I don't want to spoil the rest of my list, but I will say this is one <laughs> one of the uh, one of the <laughs> Lacerda games that I played, and I was like, oh, I need to play this again. Yeah. I'm like, that was so cool. <laughs> And of course, I haven't played it again yet, but I will. It I sounds will. like we need a Lacerda day too. I know, I know. And I ha- again, I have the people who are into it, and so it's just you know, uh, so many games to play, you know. But I'm I'm gonna that, make it happen. I'm gonna make it happen, yeah. especially with my recent uh, Gaia Project addiction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, can't do them all. Can't do them all. But I do want to like get back to this one um, and explore it more. And that is Liz Boa. So we right. we are on your number two. My number two, yeah, and this is kind of crazy because uh, I'll, I'll say I cheated a little bit. This one is not actually out yet, but it's but it's coming. It's Ooh. delivering very soon. This is Inventions: Evolution of Ideas. This was the one that he ran on uh, yeah. Kickstarter uh, earlier this year. The reason I added this to this list is because I we got it. We were lucky enough to get an early copy. Um, I mentioned earlier we went to the that retreat uh, and Vital was there teaching invention. So I got to learn from him. Um, and then I got to take it back and I've played it with everybody because uh, I really, really like what inventions is doing. Um, I really like the theme of this game. And if you've not seen this at all, uh, it's about inventing things and it's about uh, each player playing a civilization, but it's not a civilization game at all. It embraces this concept of sharing ideas out with the world of, of being a civilization that develops technologies and, and you get points actually for kind of sharing those technologies out with people. That's cool. This idea of like presenting these new technologies to the world. And so there's this, I mean, again, one of the most beautiful designs I've ever seen wow. uh, from Eno Tool. If you look at the board, it's like an old school map of the world. And you're kind of moving your pieces around to these different areas. And these are your citizens of your civilization going out into the world to spread your ideas. And uh, there's this multi-step uh, there's this multi-step process to getting an idea out into the world where one person like comes up with an idea and puts it out to the world and says, I've got this idea and plays a card down. And then another player can come on and actually flip that card over and actually invent the idea for the world. That's cool. And then another player can come on and kind of like evolve that idea or augment that idea. And then finally somebody can come and actually share it. So there's this sense of cooperation with different players where you're like, I'm going to put out this really juicy idea card because I want you to come and flip it. Or maybe sometimes you say, I'm going to put out this juicy card. I don't want anyone to come because I want to both present this idea and flip this idea, which you can do. Of course, you're trying to collect these ideas uh, and you have this whole like, you know, area where you all your collected ideas go that you can use to take extra actions. Uh, but what's really beautiful about this game, and we're going to have a, a whole video of it up on our uh, Man vs. Meeple channel cool, next week. Cool. Um, the thing that makes it really shine is this idea of, of chaining that he's come up with. And in a lot of his games, you get to take like executive actions. You can take a main action and then an executive action. Well, you have these chains and you can earn up to three chains based on how high you are on a specific reputation track. And those are the ch- like chain tokens you use to take actions. And so when you're taking an action, it might at some point say you can spend a chain if you've got one and then go take a second action. So you can chain up to like maybe three or four actions in a round. And so there's this whole blocking element of if you've taken an action, you can't take that action again or you can't take the action that it's even paired with. So a large part of the game, you're going to be looking and saying, I really need to take that action, but I already blocked myself. I have these chain tokens. 
what series of actions do I need to chain together to eventually get to take that action? And you're taking actions based on some cards that are out. You're taking some actions based on some bonus tiles that are out, or you can advance your civilization to a new era and get some bonus actions and use those chains. And so a lot of the game is working backwards saying, I know I want to do this thing, but how do I get there? Not to mention that as you're doing these actions, you're collecting all these tiles, these little hex tiles that come onto your civilization board and give you all these like asymmetric powers that only you're going to have. So you're really Sounds building so up this cool. unique civilization. It is. I mean, it is. It's so much fun. And normally I don't like to talk about games that aren't out yet, but I've played this game so many times this year alone <laughs> since we got it because I can't stop. Every time I play, I want to try out some new strategies and That's some new so ideas cool. because... Yeah, it's it's and it's beautiful. Like you take one look at this game board, and you're just going to absolutely fall in love with it. Um, and again, Eno Tool just did a f- phenomenal job here. And what's it called again? It's called it's Inventions Evolution of Ideas. So it was on Kickstarter yeah. earlier this year. Had a huge following on Kickstarter, uh, and it's going to be delivering um, sometime soon. I think maybe the end of this year into early next year. Awesome! Wow, I'm really excited to try that one. It sounds, well, it sounds as super I, cool. I will gladly play it with you. If I go to BGG Con, I'll bring my <laughs> bring mine. Because uh, I think That'd everybody's awesome. gonna wanna wanna uh try it. Yeah, I, I'm yeah. fine playing this one multiple times. Like some games, you know, like you said with Lacerda, like once you play it and kind of it brings back all the rules, you wanna hit it up as many times as you can. Uh this is one I could probably play every day in a weekend, like Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Let's play it three times. That's how much I really enjoy it. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. I'm a, I'm a hype for that. I'm hyped for that. So <laughs> my number two game is yeah. actually a game. So I had one Lacerda game um, on my shelf of opportunity that I have never played. And I, again, since I do have some friends who are big Lacerda fans, I – hit up one of them. My friend Tim came over just last night so that I could play this game in preparation for our conversation. And that game is CO2 Second Chance. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. CO2. That's like, that's old school Lacerda. Yeah. Yeah. It is. Well, it's from 2018 because, well, the the original one, I guess. Oh, yeah. The original original one one is from 2012. But uh, yeah. CO2 Second Chance, I bought like maybe over, it had to be over a year ago. And it was just like sitting around. And I would like, every time I went to go sell games or cold games, I was like, I don't, I want to try that. I want to try that. You know, and this one is um, published by geochicks.it and Stronghold Games. And yeah. it plays with one to four players. And yeah, I have it as number two because. It really impressed me. And it's like, it's again, my list is based on like, what am I most excited to get to the table if I could play something right now, you know? And I want to revisit this really bad already. So we played, um, so basically each each player in this game is a CEO of an energy company and you're responding to government requests for new green power plants and you're trying to stop the increase of pollution while also kind of meeting the rising demand for sustainable energy. What a cool theme, number one. What a cool theme. And this game can be played cooperatively or you can play it like the semi-co-op mode. So I've only, which is competitive, but um, I've only played this once last night and I played it, we played it cooperatively because Tim was saying he's played this like a bunch and he was saying he thought it was like best at like two for the co-op mode. So yeah, so we got together we played it. I set it up the night before we had played. And, you know, I already was like, this game seems so cool because I love the components. I love the colors, the look of the board and everything. I was already excited. Um, One of the cool things about it too, um, before I even go into like what you're doing in the game really, but is the, the player board is awesome. The player board has like everything you need to know really. And then it has these two like bookmark cards that you slot on the left side and on the right side that align with the different actions you're taking. And it explains how to take your actions. Again, this is Lacerda. So this game has three actions, three main actions. We are, and then you have these like three executive actions that you can do. And that kind of reminded me of the, um, in the coin games, those, uh, those side, options you can do on your turn 
I, yeah. for, I, I forget but, what it's yeah. called offhand. I forget what they're called too, yeah. but yes. But like, so basically each turn you're going to pick a major action and then you can do um, each of the three executive actions one time each um, if you would like to. And um, there are things that are going to just like kind of help you be more efficient, but like the main three actions you can propose, like there are the, how many different types of um, energy sources? Like there's solar. I think there were five or six of yeah. them. Uh, yeah. I don't know. It's been, man, I didn't get that one back. The more you talk about it. Yeah. Solar recycling. I think it's five. Yeah. I think there, there are five of these. And, and you're the three major actions is one thing is you can uh, make a proposal and the board is like circular and it's basically kind of looking at the world. So you're you're making a proposal for mm-hmm. like a to build a solar plant in North America or something like that, or to build a recycling plant in Africa. And um, when you so your one thing you could do is put one of these proposals out. And when you do that, depending on where you put it, um, you're able to get some resources maybe, or you're able to. Um, Get a new scientist or move one of your scientists. So you have these little workers that will help you do this stuff you're doing and help you gain knowledge. Um, That is the other thing. There are tracks for each of the different types of plants. And as you propose and move your scientists off of these different types of uh, proposals, you are gaining knowledge in that specific area, which is going to help you with some of these uh, public objective tokens that you're trying to fulfill. And um, the second action besides doing the proposal is you can build infrastructure. Um, And then the third action is you actually build the plant. And the the whole tactile experience of building your infrastructure. So every player has their own little color infrastructure pieces that slide into these like U-shaped. Yeah, yeah, these U-shaped proposals. And just because I build infrastructure on one plant proposal doesn't mean that my whoever I'm playing with can't actually build the plant. So there's a whole thing of deciding who's doing what. And ultimately, in the cooperative mode, you have a goal, right? So we had these 10 cards, these like UN objective cards. We had 10 of these face up, uh, like they're five from two different decks. And we have to, by the end of four decades, starting in 2010, uh, we have to complete seven of these uh, in a two-player game. So we have to do yeah. what we need to do to complete seven of these. In addition to that, we also have two secret goal cards, and we have to both be fulfilling one of our goal cards by the end of the game, which I love that. Like, I love that little bit of tension <laughs> uh-huh. of not knowing what Tim was going for and like, but, but being like, okay, like, you know, we're both trying to like solve this puzzle and win this game. But like, we also both need to fill our, fulfill our objectives. I don't know what his objective is. I know what my two are. So I'm trying to do that, but I'm also, we're trying to do so many different things. It's like, it's so hard and puzzly. And it's like, it's all centered around these three actions. And then for the like executive actions you can do, you can play a card. So you start a hand with these like lobbyist cards. So you can play a card if it connects to the, the action you did. Like, oh, I just built an infrastructure in Africa cool, now I can trigger this card and make some yeah. money. Because money and resources are very tight in this game. You have you have money and you have these uh, these white like technology cubes, but then you also have these chunky purple discs um, uh-huh. that are CEPs, carbon emission permits. So there are some of them in each region around this, you know, again, circular board here. But then we each start with two. And there's a whole thing where there's a market in the center of the board, because I love market manipulation, where you can, you can as a um, one of your executive actions, you can interact with this market. You could either buy a CEP, um, and once two CEPs are gone, like we clear the market there, the price mm-hmm. goes up. Um, the value goes up. So then like I could do that. I could buy the last one, make the price go up. So then Tim on his turn, if he needs money, he can sell one of his and now get more money, you know, money back at the higher rate. So you're playing around with this, this market manipulation. And, um, the other thing is at each round, 
At the end of the round, after we take in a two-player game, we each took four actions. Then you get to a phase where you get income, and then there's pollution you need to deal with. So anywhere you did not, I'm trying to think if there are six major areas around the board, but anywhere where you were not able to build a power plant, you're going to have to flip one of these like these pollution tokens, which are going to have either a 20, a 30, or a 40, and that is going to increase this pollution track, which you then need to like spend victory points to push back. And yeah. if you ever get to a point where you go below zero victory points, like you lose the game. So you're managing this pollution and you're trying to build these plants. Um, and then the other thing is you have these, these summits where you can move your scientists to these to speak at these different summits and share what they've learned and, and learn more from each other. So that's one of the ways you're working up these tracks, which you need to be up these tracks at certain levels to build the plants <laughs> of a certain level. And then you also have these tokens that get randomly placed um, at the beginning of the game. You have tokens in three different categories. One is basically how you're uh, building plants on the board. Like, for example, we had two tokens that came out that were like South America. So we were like, okay, we need to get uh, infrastructure. I think it's infrastructure or either infrastructure or actual plants. We have to do more in South America this game. Right. Because if right. you don't achieve these fast, you lose points every round and it gets incrementally more expensive so the first round for any tokens you haven't flipped because you haven't achieved those goals you lose one point in round two you lose two points per one you haven't flipped so we're like mm -hmm. racing to do that we're trying to get our objectives we're also <laughs> thinking about our personal objectives it was just so amazing like again like from a game that has very simple three main actions that are so clear. Right, again, that's, that's and, and the sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. So it was just like, it was so fascinating and it was so great to play with Tim because he's played it so many times. And you know that like, that's just sure. a great feeling to play a co-op game, especially a heavy right, one. Right, and that, that's the that's the thing is like that, that co-op mechanic, it, it's, it turned that game on its side. Like the original, you know, the original version didn't have that co-op mechanic. Oh, so I didn't know that. That was, yeah, that was introduced with CO2, the second, second, uh, chance. second chance. And like everybody, I, I don't, I would never want to play any other way. Yeah. Like, cause you don't have to play cooperatively, but man, that the cooperative is so good. I yeah. can't imagine not playing it cooperatively. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm going to try it. I'm going to try the semi co-op <laughs> just to see, but like, I agree like for me and that's why it's so high on my list because I'm like, I, I don't know if I've ever like, I'm trying to think if I like, it just felt so different. I love the theme. You feel the pressure of the theme. Like we're trying to better the world, you know, and it's, yeah, right. it's just exactly. so puzzling. You have to work together. You have to yeah. work together. And again, like graphic design, art components, so good. Um, so oh, yeah, always. Yeah, yeah. So I was just, we barely, we barely made it, but we pulled it together um, at the end and it was just so satisfying and I can't wait to play this game again. Like that's, yeah, that's, that's where I'm at. CO2 co second sure. chance. And yeah, and I think this is like just a like a lesser talked about Lacerda game too, because oh, it's, for sure. it's yeah. not necessarily like one of the big box. Well, Eagle it's Griffin not. It's ones. not Eagle Griff, right? It's yeah. not Eagle Griffin one, and those kind of do take the conversation. Yeah. So you like this one too? I do. Yeah. It's. I mean, it was lower. It's. I like the cooperative part of that game. Uh, I need to play. I've only played it once. The cooperative. And I played the cooperative game one time, and I really liked it. It was a long time ago. So if I played it more recently, it might be higher on my list. Yeah. But my, my top four are, are kind of hard to beat. Right? So, <laughs> yeah, I got you. I got you. Yeah. Um. Anyway, that was CO2 Second Chance. So what's your number one, Ryan? So my my number one, I'd be curious to see if this was your number one or if this ended up on your list or if you even thought about this, but it's Weather Machine. That is my number one Lacerda game. I absolutely love Weather Machine. Not only is it my favorite Lacerda, it is one of my top 10 games of all Wow. Time. I've not played yeah. it, by the way. I've not played oh, it Oh, okay. Well, that if you had, it might be up there. Like, this game, it's so good. Um, <laughs> there's so much... Again, it's like there's there's so much complexity happening here, like you have in another sort of game. Um, but it's this, you know, this weather machine. It's actually a really cool premise. This guy, Latif, which is Vital spelled backwards, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> has, he, he made this weather machine 
And it kind of went out of control. And instead of like fixing all the climate problems in the world, it exacerbated them and caused all these natural disasters. So that machine is, is running right now and it's just destroying everything. So your job is to come in and try to repair this weather machine by building prototypes, by kind of running these experiments and getting the weather under control. So there's this whole element of coming to this location to kind of run these experiments. There's this whole element of like fighting the weather. And then also in like what I would consider the biggest scam in history, Latif got the government involved and they're funding his ability to (laughs) fix the own disaster that he caused. So he's getting paid to fix the disaster. But there's this whole government section where they're trying to work with it as well. So you can come to the government to get upgrades and they're going to be trying to help you fight this inclement weather. And while you're doing all this, you're like studying and researching and you're gaining um, like knowledge in these different areas and you're publishing papers based on these different climates. So like you're studying, you know, a heavy heat climate or you're studying the wet climate or, or the snowy climate. And you're, you're putting these books down on, in, on a little player board and you're trying to collect these sets effectively that let you publish a paper. And if you publish a paper and like, it's a cool little research, um, a thing happening here that some people have said isn't as thematic, but like for me, I find that enjoyable. I like this idea of like, we're studying the weather. We're trying to build our own weather machine. We're trying to place these, you know, worker. it's a worker placement game, but you're placing these little robots out to like actually do certain things in spaces. Uh, and again, it's, it's very cool. And this is something that I love that Lacerda did. And he did the same thing with inventions. Every action you go to, and you mentioned this earlier with like looking at your player board, Mm -hmm. everything you can possibly do in a location is spelled out from there. And each, each area that you go to has two actions you can take. And some of the action spots let you do one or the other, and some let you do potentially both. And doing both actions is really good, but you have to be able to afford them. You have to have some of the different currencies in the game in order to spend those currencies or vouchers as they call them in order to take these actions. And a a lot like uh, Kanban, uh, Latif himself is moving uh, along these locations, but he doesn't punish you. He actually helps you by giving you uh, extra research when you get to his spaces. And so there's a whole blocking element. Players can block spots, and that means you can't go there. And also, it's one of those games where you have to keep moving your worker around. You get one worker, so you can never just like go back to the same spot. You're always working. Uh, you're always trying to push things forward, and you're trying to take actions that you don't necessarily want to take. Because you, you kind of have to do everything, but there's a whole timing aspect. And if you get that timing aspect down, it goes really well for you. And you only get income like once Latif moves from every action space back to his office. So there's a part in the game when everybody's getting really low on income and we're like running out of everything. And it's like, please just push him along because <laughs> like in combat, if he can't go to a space, he skips it. Oh, and so you can kind of like yeah. try to speed him back and you're trying to like tell the other players at the table. So there is this level of cooperation too. Uh, when it comes to like running these experiments, you're going and you're like, you're, you're collecting these gears and there you can get these cool little like metal gear uh, upgrades and you're placing these gears down, you're placing these bots down, trying to run these inventions. But if, uh, if an invention doesn't have enough robots to run, it fails and that's bad. So you're over there like talking to the players like, are you going to go here? Are you going to put a robot here? Like if you go put a robot here, I'll put a robot right beneath it. We can run this and everybody that runs it gets points. So you really want it to go off. And so there's this, it's not really a negotiation game at all, but you do kind of have to count on other players like helping you do some of these actions. Trying to do them on your own can take a lot of time, a lot of resources, and a lot of actions. Even like fighting the weather, everybody that comes and helps you fight the weather gets points as well. So you want people to come and help you fight, but they might not want to do that. So yeah, there's just a lot that goes into that. Wow, it, that sounds so cool too. And I know, like, I've seen Weather Machine yeah. out. I just haven't gotten around to playing it yet. And it looks, go- of course, it, lo- it looks gorgeous. Uh-oh. Well, but that's, the, that sounds The board really cool. is phenomenal. Everything is phenomenal. As much as I love inventions, the way that inventions look, the Weather Machine board, I think, is, is Eno Tool's greatest work. Uh, and actually, if you flip it over to the backside, it actually has the, the just the artwork that you know Tool did for the game without any of the icons or graphic design. Like, it, and I, I almost want to like hang that on my wall. It looks so good. Get a so, second copy for that. Uh, <laughs> right. So yeah, that's that weather machine again. Another one that I would play. Uh, it just at the drop of a hat. Yeah. Always. I'm I'm very like yeah. I'm more eager to to try this one now, especially as, you know, you someone who's played so many Lacerda games and 
a lot more than I have like, and you're so sure. excited about it. Like, I'm like, I, I want to try that. I want to try that. Yeah. So again, my list was based on, you know, thinking about like, I was kind of surprised that I've only played almost all these games just <laughs> one time, but yeah. I guess it makes sense. It makes sense. But the, the game that I have number one right now is the game that if I was going to play a Lacerda game tonight, this is the one I would pick. And it was the first one that I kind of like really fell in love with. Cause like I said, I played that Kanban, uh, one of the old versions of Kanban and mm -hmm. it was like very bumpy. So I didn't really get it. And then I played Vinos, the deluxe oh, edition. Yeah. yeah, this is gonna be a shocker for people because I know not many people would say like Vinos <laughs> is their favorite Vital Lacerda game. But for me, uh, I just love it. And kind of just looking back at it to kind of, you know, remind myself of how certain things mm -hmm. worked a little bit for this episode. I was like, oh, I want to play this. It looks so cool. I, you know, and I'm just, I instantly started remembering back in 2019 when I played this game. And the other thing wow. that's really significant about this, this was the first game, like the first heavy game that I taught to people on my own. Cause I remember I was like nervous. I was like, I want to, like, I made sure. myself a little like teaching guide. So I, so I, you know, explain things in a like methodical order and everything. Cause I was like, this is my first time. Like we're all new players. Cause usually like at that point I was like maybe a year into the hobby. So I was mostly like learning games from other people, especially if yeah. it was like a heavy game. So anyway, I got Venus deluxe edition. Um, it originally came out in 2010 uh, from what's your game. And then Eagle Griffin put out the deluxe edition in 2016, which it has a double sided map. I have only played the 26. Uh, 2016 version so i haven't played what most people find to be the best version the version with the cool bang oh really yeah so i i haven't even played that yet and i love this you game you should though you i know should. i i will i'll i probably i might revisit it with 2016 just to like refamiliarize myself and then try to do it like within the same week with the the 2010 side of the board yeah but this plays with one to four players and i love like wine as a theme like so that's that's part of the hook for this game for me um you know in in Venus, you are basically a winemaker and you're running your own wine business in portugal again yeah. we're in portugal which is really cool <laughs> over six years or game rounds you're going to be like establishing estates in different regions of portugal and then you can buy vineyards and you can build wineries um, and then you'll be producing or trying to produce the highest quality wine you can. And you can have, you can hire helpers like onologists and farmers that can help you make better wine. And then you're going to try to like sell your wine to local establishments for money or ship it abroad to kind of increase your, your brands or your labels like reputation. Um, another cool thing about this game is that you play six years and I think after the third, fifth, and sixth year, there's a fair uh, where you're going to be able to like submit your wine for a competition. And you have these di these three different, I think it was three different like, you know, wine judges or magnates who are going to be like judging your wine on the smell, the taste, all these things. And it's, it's, it's so thematic and it's like yeah. very like the, like, you're dealing with all aspects of running the business. Like I, I used to like, I still love viticulture with Tuscany. Like it's a fun game. I love wine themes. I like, and then this game, like kind of like exploded my brain with like, in terms of like the business aspects of running a wine company, each round you have like a, a couple different phases. So there's like a weather forecast and the, the weather is going to impact the quality of your wine you're producing. Yeah. You get two actions. Everybody gets two actions. And in the center of the board, this board is beautiful, by the way. Again, you know, tool. <laughs> and yeah, in the of center of the board, there's this like three by three grid of action options, action spaces. And there's a whole thing with the way it's not worker placement, but it's more like action selection. And when you move your worker, um, if you move to an adjacent action in this grid, uh, you don't have to pay anything extra, but
But if you move further away, you have to pay. Uh, I think the currency is Bagos <laughs> in this game. Yeah, but right. like you, you have to spend money. I forget if you have to pay players at all. But then there's also like where the round tracker is. You're kind of being taxed by the game. So there's some you know, interesting choices when it comes to like which actions you're going to, you're going to need to take versus what you want to pay maybe an additional cost for, or you can sure. afford, but then your, your wines are going to age and you produce wine. And then again, you have this, this whole fair. Again, the theme is like, I, as much as I love like <laughs> Kanban EV, I love wine as a theme. Like this just excites sure. me. Cars More. are cars, yeah. but wine is wine. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so like this, this thematically <laughs> just excites me more, and and I'm just like blown away with how thematic everything is, but how yeah. also like like strategically like deep and complex it is as you're managing all these things and trying to make the quality of your wine better, and you're taking it to these tournaments, it, like. Ah, yeah. I, I just, yeah, yeah, I, it's good. My friend Richard and I, ever since we played this game, we were just like, let's play some Vinos. Let's play Vinos. I swear, if I had a dollar for every time Richard <laughs> and I have said that to each other, let's play some Vinos again. And and we just still haven't. So I need to fix that. I need to fix that because I know he would be down. At, like if I was like, Richard, come over right now, Vinos, he would be super down. I have other L- Lacerda fans who would be like down. I need to break this one out again because... um. Yeah, I don't know. It's it's just the one after thinking, like, I'm excited to revisit Lisboa as well. I also, at some point, would love to play the Gallerist again because I had kind of a... Yeah, that was... Yeah, oh, I was, yeah, I was wondering why that was... It, that's, <laughs> well, that was the first one. That was the one that I think where they, where, you know, Tool and uh, uh, Lacerda first connected was... That was my first okay, Lacerda okay. game was Gallerist. I love it. Yeah. I just don't love it more than my top four. Gotcha. So it's hard to... Yeah. I have to like I love the theme of the gallerist um but like when I learned it I don't think I got it or something you know sure. it seemed like <laughs> Sure. It's almost like some of the things you're doing are so simple like you're not I don't know there there was something that was like a miss and I feel like I should love that game so I definitely want to sure. revisit that. I think you will once you kind of get it. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. So that was like that was the other one but like as of right now I'm super excited to play CO2 Second Chance again and I'm yeah. like Vinos, I want to revisit that. I want to revisit Lisboa. Ugh. Well, if I come to BGG, I'll bring Inventions, and you can try that one too. I would, I would love that. I would love yeah. that. And now, yeah, now I want to play Weather Machine too. So yeah, right. Oh yeah, I'm, Weather Machine too. I have both of them. So I'm, d- we'll, I'm we'll dialed see. back we'll see in. See what we can work out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm dialed back in. But like, yeah, these. Well, you know, Vital is awesome. He's also a sweetheart of a person. Like it was so. Oh, he's I, the nicest guy. I got to meet yeah. him at Essen last year, and uh, that was just the, it was it was a highlight of the show for me because uh, he gave me a big old hug and was you know yeah, happy yeah. to see me too. And like so, it was yeah. But I'm just I'm just in awe by his designs. You know, uh, in terms of like how sure. thematic, how the theme always ties to the mechanisms. And you have these like simple kind of actions that just le- like branch into this yeah. craziness. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what he's known for. And it, it all comes together. Like if it didn't come together, this would be a different story for him. But they do. They really uh, – all of the, the games have complexity that really feels – Good. Once once you've kind of figured it out and know how to manipulate the game, for sure. Yeah, and I'm again, I'm really glad you picked this to talk yeah, about. Me and too. you know, this is a great Vital is a great first designer spotlight for the BGG yeah, podcast. One of the most iconic designers. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, for sure. So uh, well, thanks again, Ryan. I hope t- I hope I catch yeah, you no uh, I, at BGG Con and Pax Unplugged. I hope I hope you do too. And we I can really play, do. play a Lacerda game together. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> You've been listening to the Board Game Geek Podcast, produced and edited by Candace Harris. Special thanks to Matt Fonda for editing and mixing our music. Be sure to visit us on the web at boardgamegeek.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and Twitch under Board Game Geek. You can reach us by email at podcast at boardgamegeek.com. Thanks for listening and happy gaming.